Welcome to today's Bible of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. We all come from different backgrounds and there's these different things that bring us together. And really when we get down to it, we come to the non-denominational church, which there are so many of them now, it's its own denomination. But we have these differing backgrounds, which is the wonderful thing about being a non-denominational church because you have all these differing backgrounds that say, you know what, I'm going to come together with my other brothers and sisters in Christ because I'm looking at the primary issues of what's happening here, right, about Jesus Christ. And so that is the, the centrality of what we do as Christians. We come together because of who Christ is. And all the little differences we, that we uh, have amongst each other, uh, whether it's end time stuff or um, you know, how you take the Lord's Supper or, or the way you look at things, it's all in your upbringing, what you've been taught. Now, when I came to Christ, I started looking through the scriptures. I didn't have a denomination because I didn't grow up in church. In fact, I, I didn't know what any of them believed. And so I kind of had to figure that out. And I started searching the scriptures until I came up to the place to where I thought was the most accurate. And most of us, or some of us do that. I won't say most. I think that's too broad of a statement. But some of us come up that way as well. Some of us come up on the, on the coattails of somebody else. And that's just what we believe. And it's up to us individually to get in there and learn the scriptures. So let God talk to you so he can reveal those things that are most important. But I'll tell you, I always try to take a primary stance with anything. There are differing views, but we have the same Christ. And you can't, you can't falter on that. You can't falter on who Jesus is. But many of us come up in here and we start to put these walls up saying, well, I'm not going to go over and participate with these other folks. Because they have these small differences here and there. And even non-denominational churches do that, which is kind of ironic, really. But non-denominational churches will still put up walls and say, well, we're not going to associate with this group over here. Oh, you wear ripped and flip-flops. I'm not a part of the Calvary Chapel movement. <laughs> so I don't agree with it. Come on. You know, <laughs> you know it's... But they're all brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to get through it. But we don't always see it that way because we have preconceived notions about what it is we think that they should believe. And so instead of looking at the primary issue of Christ, we look at all the secondary and the tertiary issues, is what I call them, uh, of, of things that they believe. And we use that as a measure of who they are. Well, as we go through... Our scriptures today in this last portion of Acts chapter 5, hopefully there will be some encouragement there to kind of look beyond some of that stuff as we go through this. But before we get into the word here, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word that we have. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and to share your word uh, for each and every one of us. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit takes control of us, that we would set ourselves aside, allow you to work. Um, work so much, God, that it, it, others would just feel your presence, that they would sense it, and they would want to know more about it, and, and they would come out of the woodwork saying, I don't know what that was today, but I felt a presence somewhere, and Lord, let that be from us. Let it be from the other Bible-believing churches, those uh, churches that, that hinge solely on you, Lord, that are out there doing those things that you call each and every one of us to do. I pray that all of that goes out today, and it doesn't just remain for this day, but it stays in the future. So, Lord, we just ask for you to be with us as we get into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, I'm going to go through, and I'm going to read through uh, the scriptures here as we see them. I'm going to talk briefly about them, kind of tell you what's happening. And then we're going to go through, we're going to ask a few questions that come up from these. 
So starting in verse 27, and you'll probably recall some of this because we covered it last time, really 27 through 32, uh, we covered all that. But it's very relevant to what's happening here, so we need to understand what's going on. So starting in verse 27, it says, And then they had brought out them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Do we not strictly command you not to teach in the name, or in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now, if you recall, Peter and John uh, and the, well, the rest of the apostles really had gone out and they were speaking in the name of Jesus and they were told not to and so they're brought in. This is really the second time that they were told not to do this and they got thrown in jail. So this is the second wave of persecution that we see here in the book of Acts. They got thrown in prison and... At night, an angel of the Lord came and released them. Released them to go and said, for this specific reason, this, the reason for you to go out, stand your ground in the temple and preach the name of Christ, that's why I'm going to let you out. And so that angel of the Lord came, released them, and the apostles went about their way doing exactly what it was they were told to do. And now we catch up with them. The captain of the temple and the guardsmen, they went out after somebody said, hey, we know where they're at. We found them. They're exactly where we left them. Or at least before they were thrown in jail. They were doing exactly the same thing. And so the captain of the temple and the guardsmen went out and they retrieved them and brought them now into the temple here or into the uh, council. And if you remember, the council would sit around um, the large Sanhedrin, the great Sanhedrin of 70 plus one really, uh, would sit around in a semicircle and they would have complete view of all of the um, accused and they would have a complete view of those that are around them so they could see each other. But they weren't the only ones in there. There were other folks in there, uh, scribes and such, and they would actually form kind of like a tier going down. So there'd be different witnesses and there would be clerks that would sit on either side, one on the left, one on the right, and they would record everything. And so all these people were in there and, and they brought them back in. And they said again, hey, we told you not to say this name. Do not speak in this. And not only are you speaking in a still, but you've got all of Jerusalem hearing this doctrine. You're, they've been filled with it. And you're blaming it on us, nonetheless. You're blaming us on the misfortune of this man. And so we want you to knock it off. But Peter stands up in verse 29, and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So not only did the council say, we told you to stop speaking about this man, and you're blaming us for it. And then Peter and the rest of the apostles says, okay, well, let me tell you about this man that we're going to blame you for. Automatically, he just says it again. And so they give him this other witness here, this in front of the council, a captive audience. And he says, well, we ought to obey God rather than you. And so in verse 33, we see the outcome of this little speech that Peter and the apostles gave. Now, Peter is mentioned here because he was probably the spokesman of those apostles that were there, as he often was. But we see the outcome of this speech that was just given. It says, when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. That word furious that you see there literally means to be cut in two, to be sawed in half. That's how deep they were cut. That's how angry they were. It wasn't a fleeting, oh, well, that's kind of annoying. It was, man, these guys, the nerve of them to be able to stand up here and tell us this stuff. This sense of the word tells us they were ready to have them executed. They've already done it to Jesus. Nothing would stop them from doing it to his followers. That's the sense we get from this word. We're not reading too much into it. That's the connotation of it. That they were ready to have these, these apostles killed for what they're doing. And yet somebody stands up. says then, verse 34, one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people. 
and commanded them to put the apostles aside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For at some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So you had this man who, in this semicircle of council members, stood up and said, hmm, let's take a time out here for a second. Let's send them out, and let's discuss this. He could obviously sense and see, and they were probably discussing it, that they were ready to have them executed. And Gamaliel stands up and says, hold on a second. Let's talk about it. We'll send them out. And let's, let's continue this. And he tells them a couple of stories about a couple of men who had these uprisings. And they continue on. He says, And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And what happens? They agreed with him. They listened to what Gamaliel had to say, and they agreed with him. He toned them down enough to come up with a solution, at least an immediate solution, because who knows? Maybe part of that was that they feared another uprising. Maybe he could see the handwriting on the wall for that, that there might be another uprising if they have these men killed for what they're saying, what they're doing, what they believe. And so he's trying to squash that a little bit. And so they agreed with him in verse 40. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Every time I look at that, I think of my childhood. Even not growing up in church and not doing this, I think of my little brother, really, and how annoying he was. And I'm six years older than he is. And I see these guys, because how many of you have ever had that person, you tell them not to do something, they say, okay, and they do it. And you say, look, I told you not to do this. Okay. And then they do it. And it just keeps going on and on until you get so frustrated with them. Well, that was my little brother. Except he would, he would do things, unprovoked things, mind you. <laughs> they really were. He was so mean to me. But, and he would do these things... And then I would retaliate because I'd, I'd have enough. He was just doing it to, to push my buttons. And I'd retaliate against him and he wouldn't like that. So then he'd push back again. And we'd go through this cycle until somebody got hurt. <laughs> yes, I was six years older so it wasn't me that was getting hurt. <laughs> but I, I couldn't understand, I couldn't wrap my head around it of why he would continue doing this. Why would he act this way? Why would he be like this? And every time I see this, I think of the apostles and I think of my little brother and like, why would they do that? Why would they keep going? Every time Peter, John, the rest of the apostles, whoever it was, every time something happened, they said, don't do this. They said, mm-hmm. And it, immediately following, you would see them doing the exact same thing. So e either somebody is super stubborn or they really believe in what they're doing. Now in the case of my brother, he was just stubborn. But in the case of these guys, they absolutely believed in what they were doing. But this brings up a number of questions as we go through this. And oftentimes, and somebody had asked me earlier between services, uh, how long does it take me to prepare messages? How long do I do this? Uh, so on and so forth. You know, one of the things that I do is I actually look at the scriptures and I, and I ask questions. I'm like, wait a minute, why is it that way? 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the questions, some of the questions that I might ask. And so as we look at this, maybe it'll spark something for any of you if, if you don't do it that way. Maybe it'll help you to understand because some people are like, I just don't know how to study the Bible. I don't know what to do here. Well, sometimes it's just by asking questions. Why is it that way? So here's the first question going all the way back to verse 27. And if you look at the scriptures, you can see it. But why did the council not mention the escape? Why did the council not mention the escape? Now, if you recall everything that just happened, what we just talked about, that these men were placed in here, and all of a sudden they're not in there. Well, where are they? Well, they're back in the temple, doing exactly what we told them not to do. Nobody said, well, how'd they get there? Who let them out? Well, we know by Luke's account that he says, an angel of the Lord came. An angel of the Lord came and set them free to go do an exact thing. But nobody said, wait, by the way, not only did we tell you not to do this, but how did you get out? How did you escape? Was it perhaps that maybe this council knew that they were fighting against God in the first place? And that they had no real power in what they were doing? If you think back to chapter 4, just after Peter and John had said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to rise up and walk. Remember that, the man? He had been crippled from, from birth. And the council brought those two in, Peter and John. And they said, look, I don't know what's happening here. They eventually put them outside so they could deliberate. And they said, obviously a notable miracle has happened. We can't deny it. That's their, their words. That's what they said. Is it perhaps that they didn't mention the escape because they saw it happen again? And that they were just looking at it through man's eyes. They decided to ignore it because they knew that God's power was greater than what they have. And maybe they were fighting against God at this point. Is it possible that any one of us, as we look at, say, other denominations, or we look at other Christians, or we look at things that are happening in our lives, we say, I'm just going to, I see what's going on. I can see the notable miracle. I can't deny it. I'm just going to ignore it. Is it possible that we are no different than those council members in this instance? When it comes to acknowledging what God does. Every single one of us have something in our lives that we don't acknowledge. Me included. Because we decide, I have a particular path. This is the path that I need to be on. This is the path that I'm supposed to be on. And God, if you change that, you obviously made a mistake. Even though we wouldn't say that to anybody else. But when we question those things that happen, what do you think is happening? We're saying that to him. You sure, God? I know you've been perfect in everything else, but maybe this one time, maybe you messed it up. Yeah. These council members who were here, who were supposed to know the scriptures, had read these things, seen them time and again, seeming to be fighting against God. You remember in Daniel chapter 3, when Shad, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were there in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had made, had a gold statue made. And he said, everyone's going to worship this because by doing that you really worship me. And so some other folks who didn't seem to like these young men said, I tell you what, I'll make a decree then. Whoever doesn't do that, whoever doesn't bow their knee to this statue, they get, th they get killed. He said, what a great idea. Well, come to find out some of his favorite people wouldn't do that. And so what does the scripture tell us? It tells us that he got very angry. His countenance changed. And he got so angry, he said, you know what, it's going to make this seven times hotter, this furnace that I'm going to put you in. And they said, it's okay, we're still not going to bow down to you, because if God wants to save us, he will. They knew this. They knew all these scriptures. And they could see how God would work miracles time and again. Yet they refused to acknowledge them in their present circumstance. Everything that had happened with Jesus, with his followers, all these things that are going on, 
Obviously, there's a notable miracle. We can't deny it, but we're just not going to acknowledge it. But that happens to each and every one of us as well. The trick is to acknowledge those things and say, praise God. Whether it's a good one for my personal health or any other reason or not. Praise God because it's a notable miracle. But the second question is this. Why did the apostles not give a defense? Rather, they gave a witness. They did not give a defense. They gave a witness instead. And so as they were in there, they decided they were going to say, well, we know you told us not to do this, to, to speak in his name, and we did it. So we're sorry. And... I'd like to put up a defense for the rest of us. They didn't do that. They said, well, let me tell you about him. Let me tell you exactly what you're telling me not to tell you. That's what they did and said. Perhaps it was because they decided that uplifting Christ was more important than defending themselves. And that's exactly what we see happening here because he says... That we ought to obey God rather than men. In that circumstance, God was number one for what was being said. Now, in every circumstance, God should be number one. I don't think any, any one of us would deny that. I don't think that council would have denied that. And so maybe in some way, they were trying to appeal to what they knew about God. If it's of God, then we should obey it. If it's from men, not so much. Not if it kicks against God. And so we can see that they were certainly more concerned with the witness of Christ than they were for their own defending. But we see this happening as well through their submission. Through their submission and authority. Now Romans chapter 13 verse 1 and Titus chapter 3 verse 1 and in 1 Peter chapter 2 we see different accounts that tell us to submit to some type of authority. Why? What does it do? What does submitting to authority actually do for us? Well, based on the teachings of Christ, it, it shows us that we have, um, we have acknowledged the responsibility that those in authority who apparently the scripture tells us God appoints, and so we submit to them. We don't fight against them because we feel like fighting against them. We submit to them because that's the right thing to do. That doesn't mean you don't stand up for yourself. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But they submitted to this authority. When they were in the temple area and the captain of the guard, captain of the temple and his guardsmen came, there was no conflict. They took them, they grabbed them, and they went. There wasn't a conflict on either side. Not that, the, that we have recorded here. The apostles did not say, hey everybody, let's rise up now. Let's take this back. Let's do this. Let's take it away from these oppressors. Could they have done that? They could have done that. But they decided not to do that because they knew that wasn't the right thing to do. Because God had a greater plan that they could stand right in the middle of this council and witness to a captive audience that didn't want to hear it. And perhaps maybe someone in there decided they were going to listen to it. But they knew the importance of submitting to authority. John stopped. He was, a, he was an Anglican uh, who has since fallen asleep, but a wonderful, wonderful saint, uh, excellent writings. He writes this, he says, To be sure, Christians are called to be conscientious citizens and generally speaking to submit to human authorities. But if the authority concerned misuses its God-given power to command what he forbids, he being God, or forbids what he commands, then the Christian's duty is to disobey the human's authority in order to obey God's. In this moment, they submitted, but they did not obey of what God was commanding them to do. They submitted to the authority of going with them and standing in front of the council, yet they disobeyed because they were trying to stifle what it was God had them do, and that was a message, to deliver a message and that's why they said, well, it's better for us to obey God than men. But this brings us to our next question. What was the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Well, because we know that both of them were in there. 
Gamaliel was a Pharisee. And we can see rising tensions between the two factions. And so in Judaism, you had the two. And they were the, kind of the main two. You had the others, the Sinis and some others. But the main two were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were very strict with the word. They would take the written word and they only went by that. There was no uh, meditation for divine revelation through the scriptures. There was no, let's work through this. Everything was very strict. This is the way it is. And because they couldn't see it, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels and demons. So all of this stuff that's happening in here, this whole thing about Jesus and the resurrection, was not on the Sadducees' side. If they were to say, well, an angel of the Lord came and let us out of prison, then they wouldn't have believed that either because they didn't believe in that. Possibly, in their own minds, they had made up that somebody on the inside, a sympathizer, let them out. And maybe that's why they didn't even ask the question. But in any case, the Sadducees were the dominant ruling sect in the Sanhedrin at the moment. They had more prominence at this point in time. They weren't the only ones there, but they certainly had command of the rule. But the other side of that are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees really did start out with good intentions. They wanted to take God's word and they wanted to preserve it, not only the written word, but through an oral tradition. So they'd pass it down. And that was kind of the way that they did it. They'd pass it down through this oral tradition. So the Pharisees would take that and they would read into it. And they would expound upon it. And they would do these things. And that was in stark contrast to what the Sadducees would do. Yet each one of them were a faction of Judaism. And so they tried to work together. So you had these Pharisees, you had these Sadducees. And later on you'll see as Acts continues that they really started to rise in their tensions between each other. But this leads us to Gamaliel. And why would Gamaliel defend the apostles' movement? Why would he defend them at all? Here he is a Pharisee. In fact, Paul says later on in chapter uh, 23, I believe, 22, 23, he says, look, I'm a student of Gamaliel. I've been taught by him. And here Paul has been a Christian for a long time at this point. And he says, I was taught by this guy as if it's a point to stand on. Well, who was Gamaliel. Well, Gamaliel was the son or the grandson. Um, not exactly sure which one he was, but we know that he was either the son or the grandson of a man named Hillel. And that's not to be confused with Hallel, which means praise, but Hillel was his name. Hillel was another leader, he had a school of thought within the Pharisaic community. So among the Pharisees, you had two schools of thought, two major schools of thought. And if you start thinking to yourself, wait a minute, how am I supposed to keep track of this? You have Pharisees, you have Sadducees, and inside the Pharisees you have this school of thought and that school of thought. Welcome to Christianity. <laughs> but there, you had those two major schools of thought. One from Hillel and one from a guy named Shammai. Shammai was very conservative, very by the book. That's the way he taught, and he had quite a number of followers. Hillel was a bit more liberal. If you were to take Jesus and say, well, if Jesus were just a man, which school of thought would he be in? He'd be in the Hillel thought. That's where he'd be. Because what Hillel did was teach everyone to expound what the word says, what the scriptures say. And that's what Jesus does. Now, Jesus is in no way, shape, or form down on that level. He is well elevated above that. But that's what Jesus does as well. For example, marriage. Well, you can either write this or, or not write it. You can get divorced. But I tell you that God hates divorce, right? He expounds upon it. He opens it up so that we can see all the nuances of it so we can go, oh, well, that makes a lot more sense. And as people, that's what we need a lot of times. We need somebody to make sense of it for us. And that's what Jesus does. Well, that's what Hillel did. He tried to ex expand it so that it made more sense to everyone else. 
And that's where Gamaliel comes from. In fact, Gamaliel becomes that guy that they call Rabban, which may sound familiar, Rabbani. And who gets called Rabbani? Jesus does. That means master teacher, right? The great teacher. Well, eventually those in Judaism call Gamaliel that. He's one of the only ones to ever be called that. It's because of what he did for them. In fact, the Mishnah writes this. And the Mishnah is really the writings of the, the oral tradition of the rabbis as they send it down. The Mishnah captures those oral traditions. Mishnah says this about Gamaliel. It says, when Rabban Gamaliel, the elder, died, the glory of the law ceased and purity and abstinence died about the same time. That's how they held him. That's, that's how much esteem they held for him. How much faith they had in this man. And I want you to notice that he's the one that stands up. Now the one who stands up is usually the high priest. Anyone else is not permitted to do it. But he stands up and says, let's put him outside. And nobody fights against him. Nobody says, Gamaliel, you're out of line, sit down. They let him do it because they understand that this guy has a lot of influence. And so Gamaliel seems to be helping them. Was he a sympathizer? I don't know. Was he as wise as we make him out to be? Well, some part of me wants Gamaliel to really be a hero. To really be a guy who's most of all going to be saved. But I don't think that's the case. We see him doing this, and it's a wise decision on one hand, wise in accordance to what God and his plan is, what the apostles need to do, wise for them, but unwise for the council. So we have mixed emotions here about Gamaliel. Was he really just doing this for political reasons? Oftentimes, when they did these things, it was because of political reasons. It was a political gesture, a political move, so that they wouldn't be harmed. If they decided, well, let's go ahead and execute them, what kind of uprising might they have had? And it's something that he was probably considering. But he says, let's just let them go. And he gives reasons why. And he starts to tell these stories about these two men which is really his first mistake. He tells these stories about Thutis and about Judas of Galilee. In other words, he's taking Jesus and he's equating him to these men and their uprisings. That's his first mistake. So what is his real thought about Jesus? Well, his real thought about Jesus is that Jesus is just a man who is trying to start something, and these people are following. Well, if you look at this, and this is really for my, my Bible scholars out there who say, well, if I look at through this and I consult Josephus and I consult these other books, I don't know if this is accurate. Well, Josephus does tell us that there was a Thutis who had a following, that had an uprising some 10 years after this speech was given. But this Thutis seems to be before that. Do you realize that Thutis was a pretty common name? And there were a lot of uprisings that happened. Especially around the time that Jesus was a small child. That's where Judas of Galilee comes in. Because he is recorded as being there during the time of Quirinius when he sent out the census. If you look in Luke chapter 2, you'll see that Korea sent out for the census to be done. And this was an uprising that Judas of Galilee, that he organized. And he ended up dying. But it was against the Romans. He did it because he felt that they were being treated unfairly. And he wanted to break free from the Romans. Well, the same thing happens with Judas. He wants to break free from whatever's going on. So it's possible that this Judas is about the same time as Judas of Galilee. In either case, neither one of them equate to what Jesus is doing. Because Jesus didn't say, look, we need to break away from this Roman oppression. He said, I've got a message for you. 
That was his uprising. His uprising was for reconciliation. His uprising was for redemption. That is in no way, shape, or form the same as what these two men were trying to do. So that was Gamaliel's mistake, is equating Jesus with them. But he also says in here, as he continues on, for if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now, how many of us would agree with that? Yeah, most of us would shake our heads. What a great sentiment. Is it completely accurate? It depends on your perspective. If you say, well, from God's perspective, yes, it is accurate. If it is of men, it will come to nothing. From a human perspective, that is not accurate. It's a yes and a no answer. So when Gamaliel presents this and appealing to their godly nature, as much as we want to call it that, he's saying... Nothing will happen here because these men can't make anything happen because they are just men. Do you realize that God uses mankind for his purposes? So there are things that mankind does that actually do succeed. When you look at it from God's perspective, you can't do anything right. You can't, you can't progress the way that it should. It won't come to anything. When you look at it from man's perspective, it will come to something. Because the way God uses men and women is for his glory, through his purposes. Maybe some of us are happen, having something in our own lives that we don't understand why, it's, why we're going through that. We don't understand the purpose behind it. We don't understand why it's so rough, why uh, this disease is happening, why this person has to pass away, you know, why this or why that. Why all these bad things? But we don't have the perspective of God. We can only see so far in front of us. The remainder of it is his to see. And so when we try to look out there and we say, I just don't understand then we need to give it to God and say, well, God, I need you to make me understand because I can't see it. And you know how he does that a lot of times? He says, put faith in me. Put trust in me that whatever this bad situation is is going to get turned around for good. So when we look at it from that view and Gamaliel says, but if it's of men, it will come to nothing. If it's of God, you can't overthrow it. It's a true statement, but only partially true. Because God absolutely uses men and women to make things happen. And so they do come to fruition a lot of times. And the things that we see as bad, God has the big picture, so he's going to see it eventually as good. It may not be good in the moment for our well-being or for somebody that we know, but in the long run, it leads to redemption. In the long run, it leads to restoration. So for any one of us that are going through these, these tumultuous times, it's kind of like when we, we look around the world and we say, well, look at all this bad stuff that's happening. Folks, take heart. Take heart because redemption still exists. Restoration is still going to happen. Reconciliation is still possible. Do not get inundated with all of these things that happen around us and say, oh, I'm just going to throw up my hands. I can't deal with this anymore. Yes, you can through Jesus Christ. And if you put your hope in him and you think forward considering the outcome, then that's all there is is hope. The anticipation of something good. That's what hope is. And so if you anticipate the goodness of Christ, then you can look at all these things and just see how God is working through it. And have faith in him that that thing's going to come to fruition. His redemption, his restoration. But the other part is, now we're going to turn it back kind of to the Christian side because we see what Gamaliel's doing for these apostles here. 
and how they're being catapulted right back out into the public eye so they continue preaching what they're doing and sharing the gospel. But he didn't stop them. In Mark chapter 9, we catch a glimpse of factions, sectarianism, if you will. Jesus had just had a conversation with John and his brother, James, and they were asking, well, can we get to be the best? Do we get to sit by your right and your left? And, you know, what do we have to do here? What do we have to do to get those seats? He said, well, you have to serve. How about that? And they're not even for you, so just serve anyway. But then right after, John says, wait, oh, by the way, Jesus, I saw these people over here, and they were talking about you. They were speaking in your name and they were casting out demons in your name and they were doing these miracles and stuff in your name. And we told them to knock it off because they're not part of us. And what was Jesus' response to that? Do you remember? He says, don't tell them to knock it off. That's for good. So what if they're not in our little circle? They've obviously been listening to something. And oftentimes, people that aren't in our little circle, we push off and say, you can't do that. Knock it off. Stop it. Which goes back to the point of the very beginning. We see these as a non-denominational church coming together. Partially, we've done that. But then there are those times we say, well, I don't like the way they teach over there. And they don't teach it just right. So I'm not going to support anything that they do. Or, I don't like the way they worship because the words that they say, they're, little, they're, they're not exactly what I would say. So I'm not going to support them. Do you realize how ridiculous that sounds? And every one of us say, yeah, that's not right. But some of us do that time and again. I've done it. I can't support them because they don't believe everything that I believe. And that is absolutely foolish. That is pulling a John talking to Jesus and saying, well, we told them not to do it because they weren't in our group here. And he says, don't forbid them. Well, it brings us to the last portion here. Why did the apostles continue doing exactly what they were told not to do? The easy answer is to say because they had the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was guiding them. And that's a correct answer. But there's more to it than that. Why did they continue doing what they were told not to do time and again? If you look at it, it says, and they agreed with them. The council agreed with Gamaliel. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, if you look back in Deuteronomy chapter 25, specifically verse 3, you see the stipulations for flogging. If you flog someone, it's no more than 40 lashes. 40 lashes. And now, what they had done is they had brought that down to 39. Because they said, well, far be it for us to overstep what the law says. We better take one off just in case we miscount. And so, they would give them 39 lashes. Now, how many of us remember getting a switch for our grandma who says, go out and give me a switch? Maybe some of you have done that. Go give me a switch. Well, I remember getting a switch from my grandmother. And I was always an idiot when I did it because I'd bring back this little twig. <laughs> and that would just give me in more trouble. And if she had to go get the switch herself, it was usually from an oak tree that was knobby. Yeah, it really happened, people. And I'm sure it happened to a lot of you too. <laughs> but that's nothing compared to what they just went through with this flogging. When they would get flogged, it would leave open cuts on their backs. They would aim for the back, but if it wrapped around, well, they just shouldn't have moved. And so they would beat them 39 lashes over and over and over again. And then send them on their way. As to say, this is your punishment, and now move on. 
just don't do this anymore. But yet what we see in here is that so they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They had just received 39 grueling lashes. And they left rejoicing. The same word, the, the Greek word that we get rejoice from is the exact same word that's used in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. Where Paul says, I rejoice in my afflictions to suffer for Christ for what he's lacking. And why does he do it? For the church is why he does it. And you say, wait a minute, why would Christ lack anything? How is that possible? It's like Christ has his torch. He says, my work in this particular area is done. I'm going to hand it to you and you must carry on. That's what it means by that he's lacking in that. That it's a continuation to everyone else that follows him. And so these apostles did the same thing. They picked that up. And that word that we have there, rejoice, really doesn't do it justice because that's a deep joy that they have. It's a joy that nobody can stifle and it comes really welling up from the Holy Spirit that they've received. And so that joy that they come out with is more than just a high five saying, woohoo, look what we did. That's a wow, I can't believe this just happened. Somebody is acknowledging Christ and they're doing so enough that they're going to harm us. How awesome is that? Now, none of us wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to be flogged today. <laughs> and we shouldn't go out looking for trouble. We shouldn't step out in the streets and say, I wonder what kind of trouble I can cause by using Jesus' name. That's not the point of it. The point is to live for Christ, to talk about Christ, but have faith that he's going to pull us through that and to have the joy that he has given us, a complete joy, so that we can continue on doing it. Because believe you me, there are those moments that we have where those just absolutely nasty things are happening to us. And it may not be physical. It could be uh, economical, it could be financial. It could be uh, a loved one that just turns away from us. It could be a number of things that reject or persecute in some form or fashion because of our faith. That's what's happening here with the apostles. In some form or fashion, because of their faith, they were flogged. But they were let go. What a mistake that was, at least for them, for the council, for us, not so much. Can you imagine if they hadn't been let go? I can. God would have come up with another way for us to be here. That's the point of understanding faith, is understanding that God's still going to make things happen even when they're tough, even when they're difficult. But that's when we need to reach down and we need to rejoice just as they do. So when somebody comes up and says, I can't believe you're for this Jesus. In fact, stop it. And they persecute you in some form or fashion. You may not like it. It may not feel good. But remember in that, you can rejoice in Christ. And say, look, somebody's taking notice. Praise God for that. And that's the point that every one of us need to get to is to be able to praise God in all of the times, not just the good ones, not just to say, wow, everything's great. Praise God. It's when you're at rock bottom, when you're sitting down there at the bottom, you say, praise God. That's the point that all of us need to be at. That's when your faith really comes alive. Well, these apostles continued in verse 42, daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They still went back to the same place they were found. They didn't hide. They went back to the temple, probably in Solomon's porch on the east side where they would always meet. But not only that, they were meeting in the homes because they said, this right here is our church. If this building didn't stand here today, our church would still exist. Our church would just meet somewhere else. Our church would meet in a larger venue. Or we might meet in our homes. Or we might meet over here or in this field. Either way, our church will stand. And that's what they realized, that it was going to continue building that way. It didn't matter if they get kicked out of the temple. 
if they were having church in a jail cell, if they were having it in someone's home, didn't matter where they were at, they were always the church. That's because of their faith that they had in Christ to bring them through so that they can and will always rejoice. And I hope your son to die for each and every one of us. And that through that, we get the reception of the Holy Spirit. Once we acknowledge that and understand that Jesus has been raised and lives and works for us and through us. So Lord, I just pray that somebody acknowledges that today and that they turn to you, not looking for an easy road, but looking for the right road. So I thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lead me to the